All right, well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the second part of my series. We're going through the life of Joseph that we're calling From the Pit to the Palace. Today we're going to be in chapter 39, and we're going to be talking about Joseph as a young man as he arrives in Egypt. And in this chapter, Joseph's going to go through three unpleasant things in his life, three things that are really going to challenge him, but there's going to be one constant. And I kind of talked about it last week, kind of being the main theme of Joseph's life that no matter what he went through, that God was always with him. And that's what I'm calling today's message, is Joseph, that God was with him. And we're going to read through all of the chapter, chapter 39 during this lesson, but for the sake of time, we're not going to read it here at the beginning. But uh, let's look at how God kind of bookends this chapter with that key theme to start off with. So in chapter 39, verse 2, the Bible reads, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. If we turn over, when we get near the end of the chapter, in verse 21, the Bible reads to us, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in sight of the keeper of the prison. So that's how we know for sure that God was always with Joseph. And like I said, there's going to be three different situations he's going to be in where he's really going to need God to be with them. And there's situations that we're going to go through in our lives that are very similar. So we can learn a lot from this chapter. But before we get into those situations, just in case you weren't here last week or maybe you forgot a little bit, let's, let's kind of catch up and do a quick recap of how we got to this point. Right? Last week we learned that Joseph is of the lineage of Abraham. He was his great-grandfather with his grandpa being Isaac and his father being Jacob or Israel. We talked about how there were similarities in those families' lives, Right? They had similar behaviors, such as doubts, as not being able to have kids, how both, all their family, they had been known for deceptive activities and favoritism and competitiveness between family members and stuff like that. But Joseph was a little bit different. He's going to break that mold. We learned that Joseph was the favored son of his father. He was the one that gave the evil report of his brothers back to his father. And his father, Jacob, gave him a coat of many colors. And this favoritism and all that caused his ten older brothers to really, really hate him. We also learned that Joseph was a dreamer. He received two prophetic dreams from God in chapter 37, and we're going to discover next week that Joseph had been given the gift of receiving the interpretation of dreams from God. So dreams are an important part of Joseph's story, and it's really important about how he got here where we are at today, because the prophetic dreams we talked about last week, they caused the hate in his brothers to grow even stronger, and we learned because of that hate in Joseph's brother's heart that they wanted to kill him, right? They conspired when they saw him coming from far away. They plan to put him into a pit and leave him to die there. However, one of his brothers, Judah, spoke up and said they did not need the blood on their hands, right? So instead of leaving him there to die, that they should just pull him out and sell him into slavery. And that's what they did when some Ishmaelites passed by. They sold Joseph to them for 20 pieces of silver. And finally, we learned after that that Joseph's brothers went back and deceived his father, Jacob, right? They dipped his coat in many colors. They dipped it in some, some lamb blood and took it back there and said that, told their father that they found it in the wilderness. Jacob rent his clothes and went into a great mourning. And from there on, he and his entire family, Jacob, I'm saying when I say he, Jacob and his entire family, they were living as, as if Joseph was dead. But we're going to learn here in chapter, we know that Joseph wasn't dead. He was sold into slavery. And we're going to pick up in chapter 39 and we're going to learn what Joseph has to go through. So let's get into today's lessons and talk about the different situations that Joseph got himself into or didn't, got him, was forced into and how God was with him during those situations. The first thing I want you to notice, that God was with him during his time of separation. Let's read verses 1 through 6 in chapter 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, An Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass at the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. 
And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So here he leads, Joseph was brought into the land of Egypt. And I said, God was with him in his separation. Well, what was he separated from? Well, first he was separated from his family, from his friends, from his culture. Remember back to chapter 37, how old Joseph was when this happened? He was only 17 years old. He was just a young man, right? He was his dad's favorite. So he was probably a little bit coddled by his father. He was probably a little bit baby, a little bit taken care of, maybe even a little bit spoiled. And while his brothers, we learned that they weren't that fond of him. They really didn't care. I'm sure he had some friends around there, some people that he, he could talk to, some people that he could confide in. You know, he was just a, what we call a, a simple country boy, right? Living out, sojourning on the land, helping take care of the flocks, helping take care of the sheep. Now all of a sudden he's thrown into a, a whole new land, a whole new culture. You know, he went from a place where he had, he had protection from his, by his father, right? He was taking care of him to a place where he was totally alone. From a place where he could talk to and confide in people to a place where he knew no one. And he could probably talk to no one because of the language barrier in a whole new culture, right? This would be like a, a young man getting, just graduating from high school here in central Arkansas. Imagine someone capturing him up and just putting him on a train, shipping him out to California, you know? Whole new, whole new world, a whole new set of ideals. And then once you get out there too, you find out those people are speaking Chinese. So now you're around a whole new people. That'd be pretty terrifying to me to think about a young man being in that situation. And I imagine Joseph was pretty terrified too. You know, he didn't know his future. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. He didn't know where he was going, who he was going to meet, what they would require him to do. But as we read in our verses, right, God was with him. God went with him. So he was not totally alone. So I have no doubt that eased some of his fear. That had to give him some comfort. You know, I had it written in here for young people in this room, but I look around, I don't see any young people in this room. So if there's any young people in, online watching, you know, around 17, 18 years old, you know you're going to have this come up in your life. Now, hopefully your life won't be as bad as Joseph. Hopefully your family's not going to sell you into slavery, right? But there's going to come a time where you're going to have to step out of the house. You're going to have to leave your family. You're going to be separated from them, right? You have to leave the comforts that were once provided to you. You're going to have to be out on your own. You may even have to go into a different culture. I tell you, if you're going from what you're used to as a member of this church into a public university as one that works there, it's going to be a little bit of a different culture for you. And you're going to have to have God with you. So if you are online listening, you know, listen up today because you're going to learn from Joseph. Stay close to God. Let him be with you the way that Joseph does. Right? I know Joseph, the, the words of God weren't written until way after the time of Joseph, because Joseph's in Genesis, right? But I'm sure that Joseph knew all these things in his heart because God was with him. He probably knew in his heart, Psalm 37, that the steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. The Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And that's what the Lord was going to do for Joseph. He was going to uphold him with his hand. He was going to guide his steps. He was going to make him prosperous in his way. But not only was Joseph separated from his family, from his land, from his culture, I want you to notice that Joseph was separated from his freedom. Right? He was sold as a slave to Potiphar. And Potiphar just wasn't your normal, average, run-of-the-mill Egyptian. He was a captain of the guard, a very powerful man in Egypt. A man from, his own, from experience knew how to uh, punish people and afflict pain. You know, nobody would want to be a slave, but man, if you're going to be a slave, Potiphar is probably the least likely person you would want to be a slave for, right? A man of that type of power. But God was with Joseph, as we had said, and I'm sure Joseph knew in his heart. As I said, Joseph had God with him, so he probably knew all this stuff that was going to come that we're going to learn later in the Bible. I'm sure God was giving it to Joseph's heart. He probably gave him Ephesians chapter 6. Where the Bible reads, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling. And singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to Christ the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatsoever things are good that any man doeth, the same how he shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Joseph was doing a good work as a slave. He wasn't doing it to, to please Potiphar. He wasn't doing it 
to be seen well of men. He was doing it because it's what God called him to do. He was doing it to please God. And what he did, God did return his promise here, what he says, right? He said, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same how he shall receive of the Lord. Well, the Lord made Joseph prosper, prosper while he was there in slavery. And not only did he make him prosper in what he was doing, he caused Potiphar to see the prospering, right? He, Potiphar saw what was happening. This called Potiphar to put Joseph in charge of everything that he had. What does, our, what does our Bible tell us here in Genesis 39, verse 5? And it came to pass that from the time he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had. You know, Joseph was in charge of everything. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Right? The house of the Egyptian was being blessed. Not because of what Potiphar had done, but because of what a Joseph had done. The blessings of God are going to extend to those around us. Right? When we're doing and we're working for God, we maybe feel like we're a slave to someone else in our job, right? But when God's blessing us, God's going to bless those that are around us also. Remember, Joseph was the seed of Abraham, and God was keeping his promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, when God told him, he said, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So, God has made that promise to Abraham, and as, and as Joseph is going on doing the work of the Lord, Potiphar's blessing him, giving him more and more power, more and more authority. God is blessing Potiphar and his household for Joseph's sake. But while everything seems to be going great in Joseph's life, remember one thing. This young man was still a slave. right? Everything he was doing, all that fortune that he was gaining, all the goodwill that was coming to his house was not going to Joseph. Right? He still had to eat of the slave portions. He still had to stay in the slave quarters. He had gained power and authority, but he was still separated from his freedom. Things still weren't great with him. And with great power and authority that he was going, that he was getting at that time, there's one thing that you can always be assured of is when you get power and authority in your life, you're going to get more problems. More problems are going to come your way. And one big one was about to come Joseph's way next in this story. So not only was Joseph, but not only was God with Joseph during his separation, the second thing I want you to notice was how God was with Joseph, Joseph during his temptation. You know, oftentimes when God blesses us the greatest, when good things start to happen in our lives, that's when we run into the greatest temptations. We see this in the life of Jesus, right? When Jesus came and he was baptized by John the Baptist, and, and God spoke down and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. What happened next? He went out into the wilderness, and he was immediately tempted by God. You can probably see this in your own experience, right? When God gives us something good, or, or we are, are doing a good work for the Lord, right? The devil wants to jump in, and he wants to pull us down. He wants to draw us out of the presence of God. And I believe that's what was happening to Joseph here. Joseph was being blessed because he was working for the Lord. So the devil stepped in and said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to tempt Joseph. We're going to try to pull him away from doing a good work work for the Lord. So let's read verses 7 through 16 here in, in Genesis 39 and see his temptation. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men in the house there within. And she called him by his garment, and say, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, fled, and got him out. And it came to pass that when she had left his garment in her hand, and he was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came unto the lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass that when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me, and fled, and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. So we see here that, that Potiphar's wife took some notice of Joseph, right? 
And especially it said after these things, after Joseph had come to power in the house. You know, I've read a lot of commentaries on this that said, you know, Potiphar's wife was probably attracted to Joseph because he was, in verse 5 it says, you know, that he was, uh, uh, actually in verse 6 it said, Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. You know, Joseph was a good looking young man. He was well built, had a pretty face. He was a beautiful young man. But it didn't seem that, that Potiphar's wife wanted anything to do with him until he got some power and some control. And that's how, it, and that's how it seems to work in life, too. When you get some power and some control, that's when these temptations are going to come. And Potiphar's wife surely was attracted to Joseph. And just a little bit about her, she was definitely not that Proverbs 31 woman that we're all looking for. Is she? she was not virtuous. She was not being loyal to her husband. In fact, she was very different. She was very direct with her advances to Joseph, saying, lie with me. You know, she didn't seem to beat around the bush. She went to Joseph and told her exactly what she wanted. I would say she probably said more flattering things that, weren't, that aren't recorded here to Joseph to get him into bed with her, making her more like what I would say a Proverbs 5 woman. In Proverbs 5, verse 3 through 5, it says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as her mouth, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take a hold on hell. This had to be a hard temptation for Joseph to resist. Right? The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how old he is when this happened. But when we look forward, you know, we get into, into chapter 41. When he goes and stands before Pharaoh, the Bible tells us that he was 30. In chapter 40, we learn that he's in prison for a little bit. And he spent at least two years there. So it's safe to say that, that he was in his mid-20s sometime when this happened to him. And... And I know what I was like as a young man in the mid-20s. It's, it's hard to resist some of those temptations, especially when someone is just throwing themselves at you. In the flesh, you know, it'd be easy for someone to give in to this temptation. And many have, right? People use excuses such as, you know, if they were in Joseph's situations, I've earned this. I've worked hard for Potiphar. I've earned a little bit of reward, you know? Or it's the culture that we're in. Everybody else around here in Egypt's doing this. They're all committing adultery. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to care. No one's going to find out. But Joseph was a godly man, and he knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong in God's eyes. 400 years before, before God gave the law to Moses, Joseph knew that adultery was not the right thing to do. And he explained, he, and he told Potiphar's wife, he gave two reasons, right? First, he didn't want to sin against his master. You know, Potiphar had been good to him. Look at verses, verse 8. He said, but, he, but Joseph refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house. And he committed all that he had to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. So he didn't want to sin against Potiphar. Potiphar had treated him well for a slave master. You know, as far as being a slave goes, Joseph probably had a pretty good life living there. He's still a slave, but he was being treated better than all the other slaves, and he didn't want to sin against Potiphar. But more importantly, though, he didn't want to be sinning against God, because he knew God was with him. Because how does verse 9 finish up? He says, how then can I do this wickedness and sin against God? Ultimately, even when no one else will find out and no one else will know, God will know. God is always with us, and ultimately all our sins, whether I do it to Dustin or really, I do, uh, just Josh, I about lost names there in my head, right? And while I'm hurting that person, I may be sinning against them. Ultimately, I am sinning against God, and God knows. So when God's with us, we want to make sure that we are behaving ourselves accordingly. And so he refused. And we all know that, that once you say no to temptation at one time, you're done with it, right? You just say, hey, no. I don't want that. Get away from me. And all of a sudden it flees. It leaves, right? No, but Potiphar's wife, she was pretty persistent, right? Joseph might have thought he won the victory and he didn't have to deal with that anymore. But notice what it says here in verse 10. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. You know, every day, this was a constant temptation, right? Every day that Joseph had to run into her, she was trying to get him to lie with her. So, Joseph did his, did, did, did his best, right? Look at the end of verse 10. 
Joseph, hearken not to unto her, to lie by her, or to be with her. He didn't even want to be around her. He invoked what is known as the Billy Graham rule. Right? That, that rule states that men should not spend any time alone with a woman that is not his wife for the sake of temptation. You know, that's how a lot of time affairs start. Men and women who are just, they just happen to be working together and they got to spend a lot of time in the workplace. And one thing leads to another. Or maybe they're, they're just friends that are going out to have dinner with each other and it's innocent. But then one thing leads to another. Or, or maybe one thing doesn't lead to another, but people think that it has. You give a perception of immorality. Don't even give someone the chance to think that you are doing something wrong. I remember back in 2020 when President Trump won the election and, and Vice President Mike Pence, right? He became our vice president, and he told reporters that, that he wouldn't go to dinner alone with any woman that wasn't his wife. And man, was he scorned. Was he laughed at by the press. And everybody thought he was a crazy man. Everybody thought that his culture was not right. And what happened shortly after that? The Me Too movement started. And all of a sudden, that Billy Graham rule started to look pretty good. And Mike Pence started to look like he was a very, very smart man. It's amazing when you follow the word of God and you follow these rules and these examples that have set forth to us, how we always come out on the winning side. And Joseph did everything he could to avoid being around Potiphar's wife. But boy, Potiphar's wife, she was, a, she was a sneaky woman, right? Joseph was doing everything correct, but she was able to ke- catch him alone, right? Verse 11, and it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men in the house there within, and she caught him by his garment, right? Maybe Potiphar's wife arranged this. Maybe she got all the men out of the house so she'd have that opportunity. Maybe she just noticed one day that there was no one around and, and that he could, she could catch him alone. But she was able to get close enough to Joseph to grab a hold of him. And as she spoke her proposition one last time, again, Joseph listened to the word of God that had not yet been written. The word that was in his heart. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Joseph was not about to sin against his own body. He was not about to sin against his master. And as we just mentioned, he was not about to sin against God. He fled. He got out as soon as he could. You know, I believe this was, a, this was probably planned. Remember I said Potiphar's wife had come to him day by day by day. So I'm sure Joseph had a plan. Man, if I ever get caught with her, what am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to turn and hightail. I'm going to turn and run and get out of here as fast as I can. You know, we should do that in our own lives. We should have a plan of action, know what we're going to do when these common temptations come upon us. But in Joseph's fleeing, his garment or his coat came off into his hands. You know, I was, I was reading this, the thought that came out of my mind, this, man, Joseph doesn't have very good luck with coats, does he? <laughs> coats always seem to be a problem in Joseph's life. But here, he left the coat in her hand. She managed, she managed to keep it, right? So there it was, Potiphar's wife had Joseph's coat in her hand. She noticed an opportunity. And, and we probably all heard the old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman, woman scorned. And in her mind, she had done no wrong. In Potiphar's wife's own mind, she was the one that had been done wrong. She was the one scorned. So she called out to the men of the house, all those people, and she lied about Joseph. She said, she, she said that he was the one that had made the advances, not her. And that she was the one who refused, not him. She lay there holding Joseph's coat until her husband came home. Kind of like, oh, poor me. You know, she was going to tell on Joseph here in a little bit. Joseph had done right. He would behaved in the right way. He was directed by the Lord, but he was about to learn a biblical truth that is expressed in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But God would stay with Joseph. Joseph. God was with him through this third and final situation Joseph found himself in. Because we have seen God with Joseph in his separation. We've seen him with God with Joseph in his temptation. Now God is going to be present with Joseph during his incarceration. Let's look at verses 17 through 23. And she spake unto him, meaning Potiphar's wife speaking unto Potiphar, according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came unto me to mock me. 
And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Right? So the Lord was with Joseph here. And the first thing I want to notice, though, that when, when Potiphar's wife, or Potiphar heard this story right, it says his anger was kindled. It doesn't necessarily say who his anger was kindled against, though. Right? I think, I believe in my heart that deep down Potiphar knew that this was not in Joseph's character. Right? He knew Joseph was a godly man. He had seen the way his house had prospered when he had trusted him with everything in his household. It was probably pretty hard for him to believe that someone that had exploited the integrity of Joseph had for so many years could commit this sin on him and in front of his gods. And Potiphar's actions seem to confirm this, you know, because you hear this from your wife, Potiphar did. He has to defend his wife. He has to save face for culture. He has to believe his wife. And there has to be some action taken against Joseph. He couldn't just ignore those claims, right? But if he thought those claims were true, I believe Joseph would have been a dead man. If he really believed that a Hebrew slave was trying to rape his wife, he would have executed him. But God was with Joseph and guided Potiphar, and instead of, instead of execution, he put him into prison. And God was with Joseph when he went into prison. That's what verse told us, right? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. He was a prisoner, Joseph was now. But imagine this, he was also the warden of that prison. That's unheard of, right? Couldn't imagine it. It makes no sense. In fact, when everything seems to be going wrong in life and things are tipsy, topsy, curvy, crazy, we have a saying for that. We say the inmates are running the asylum. Well, here we had an inmate running the asylum, but things were going great because it was the power of God. That was the case here. God was with Joseph, and he prospered in leading the prison. You know, so much that the warden, that prison leader, he didn't have to do a thing, right? What does it say? It said he looked not to anything that was under his hand. He had full trust to do what was right because God was with him. Well, that finishes up chapter 39. But one last point before we close up here. God was with Joseph through his separation, through his temptation, and through his incarceration. And all this was for the purpose of preparation. Joseph didn't know at this point in time, he didn't know the ending of his own story like we do, right? He didn't know that soon that being in prison, he was going to interpret some dreams. He didn't know soon that in the next couple chapters, he was going to become the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. He didn't know that he was going to be put in charge of food storage for a famine, be a savior for the world, and that he was going to get reunited with his brothers and his families. But how did God prepare him? God taught him, and Joseph learned at this time, no matter what life threw at him, no matter what kind of situation he was going to be in, that God was going to be with him all the time, and it would be bearable. He learned to trust God in all situations, not to lean on his own understanding, but to rather acknowledge God and let him direct the paths. So let's close this lesson with some application, right? What is the key takeaway that I hope you get from today's lesson? Well, I hope you know that we're all going to have a time in life where we face separation, a time of new beginnings, you know, a time where you might have to move away from family, a time where you may be starting a new job where you don't fully understand the concept of what they want you to do. Maybe you need to change geographic location and it's going to be a totally new culture to you. Maybe God's calling you somewhere. That can be scary. But we don't need to be afraid as long as we have God with us. God will see us through those. Secondly, we're all going to face some temptations, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath been no temptation taken to you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, 
but with the temptation shall also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. You notice here that we can handle any temptation that comes our way with the help of God, right? May not always be able to do it on our own, in our own flesh, in our own power, but God will make us a way to escape. When he's there with us, he will guide us. He will allow for us to get out of it. Finally, persecutions are going to come, right? You may not end up incarcerated, as Joseph was, but if you're living a godly life, there's going to be some unjust punishments, some unjust actions that happen to you. But when God is present, you're going to be able to make the best of a bad situation. But finally, how do we make sure that God is always present in our lives to do these things for us? Right? What does James 4, 8 tell us? It says, draw nigh unto God, and God will draw nigh unto you. So that's what we need to do. We need to keep God in our forefront. And if you're not saved today, the first thing you need to do is get saved. Right? You need to, to admit that, that you're a sinner. You need to tell, as, as Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to acknowledge that Christ died on the cross for you, for me, for all of us, because there's nothing that we could do. We need to believe that with our whole heart, right, that Christ paid the whole price, and he did that for us. And as Romans 10, 13 says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So next you just need to ask the Lord to save you. And if you haven't done that yet, I encourage you to do it today. Don't wait another minute, because as I said, these three things I mean, you know, that separation, that temptation, incarcerations or persecution troubles, they're going to come. You need the Lord in your life. And if you're not saved, he's not going to be there with you. But once you are saved, he's going to indwell that Holy Spirit in you. And he's always going to be with you. And once you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit, though, if you want to feel the full power of God, you need to make sure you're filled with that spirit, right? As it says in, in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, once you're saved, you need to seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face continually. Always be praying, talking to God. Be in his word daily, praying him, praying to him, asking him to fill you with your spirit. And when we're living that kind of life and we're close to God and he's close with us and we seek his face and begin listening to his word, talking to him in prayer, we ask to be filled with his spirit daily. He'll be with us, guiding us, protecting us, and helping us to prosper in all that we do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of Bible study. Thank you for the story of Joseph and the example of all the things that he went through in his life and letting us know, God, that no matter what we do in this life, no matter what troubles come upon us, no matter what we have to bear, we don't have to do it alone, God, that, that you'll always be with us if we just call out to you and we ask you to be with us. And whatever bad situation we may be in, you're not always necessarily going to get out of it, Lord, but you're going to help us make the best of the bad situation and everything eventually will be done for your glory and your honor. As we wrap up the Bible study this morning, Lord, I just pray that you stay with us. You, you fill this room with your spirit. You be with Pastor as he comes up to preach the message this morning. You guide our worship service so we may sing praises and glory to you. And we do all this for your glory and in your name. Amen.